So being able to be prepared up front in advance is going to be key and has been key really since 2010 when our market really entered that multiple offer environment. All right, so Lisa, uh, you know, certainly Matt laid out uh, the process and makes it sound nice, straightforward and easy, which I know is what you're looking for is, uh, you know, to minimize any of the stress in the process and to efficiently get the result that everybody's looking for. Uh, you know, in, in your experience, what is this in, in terms of the level of importance in making an offer in transacting real estate, especially for folks that might be out of the area. It is absolutely 100% critical to have the right team on your side, having the right lender, having the right agent, somebody who's on your side negotiating on your behalf. We've had two successful transactions that really stand out that we've worked with Matt on. One was, and what caused us to start working with Matt is he did a VA deal at Christmas time in You're 10 that days. guy. I've heard this from Lisa for a few months now. So, okay, it's all coming together. Yeah, so this is the guy. And then just recently, we had a buyer who went up in multiple offers against a cash deal. And because of Matt and, and Chris's um, negotiating skills and being able to present the package properly and sell the agent on why our deal was the deal. We got it. Now, how many times does that happen when you're going up against cash? Let's face it. Cash, as they say, is king, right? right. And yet not always. If you have the right lender, you have the right agent on your side, you stand a shot. And this was not what I would say a nice, easy deal. Um, the buyer even was able to get closing cost. And so it's not always guaranteed, but certainly we pulled off what I would consider probably in this market a, a miracle. And it came from having a, a, a really strong uh, process on both our side and also the mortgage side, having great reputations on both as somebody who actually gets the deal done and then having a lender that will pick up the phone and help us sit, sell this deal. And that's the kind of relationships that we look for. And it's why we have kind of upped our game this year with our lender partners. Earlier, we mentioned uh, that there are two reasons that uh, pe people traditionally have taken a look at Florida, in South Florida in particular. Uh, we have our weather and we have our taxes. And speaking of which, uh, the strategy here in Florida, and especially a lot of strategy for folks who might be dealing with uh, other states that are looking to relocate as well. We are um, we have with us Jason Brown. He's a CPA for Forsyth Financial uh, on the line with us as well. And Jason, you know, first and foremost, uh, what is the, the typical experience like for someone who is relocating uh, from, say, a northeastern state to South Florida? Uh, the, the difference in taxes and also tax strategy as it pertains to real estate. Um, yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. So um, when you come from a high tax state such as New York or New Jersey or Connecticut, um, people, you know, they'll come here and see that there is no state income tax at all. So um, obviously that's a huge significant advantage on your overall bottom line and take home money when you're only subject to federal tax and not subject to state income tax. Um, states like New York, um, the state income tax rates are as high as over 9%. And then if you live in the city, I believe there's another upwards of 3 to 4% tax. States like New Jersey also have top out at almost 9%, and Connecticut is almost 7%. So if you look at that compared to Florida with zero, obviously there's a, a significant savings. In addition to that, the new tax law um, can have a great effect on um, – on people who live in those states as well. For the first reason, the um, standard deduction has greatly increased. Um, if you are married filing jointly, you will get a $24,000 standard deduction, or if you're single, it's half of that is $12,000 standard deduction. If you're head of household, it's 18000 So what that means is if, you're, if you itemize your deduction, um, you would have to have an amount higher than that standard deduction in order to receive a benefit. One of the biggest advantages of being in one of these high-tax states is when you were able to itemize your deduction, one of the biggest deductions was how much money you paid in state income taxes. So even though you had a higher tax rate, in, you had a high 
saturated states such as New York or Connecticut or New Jersey, you are able to offset some of those taxes um, because you receive a deduction on your federal return. So not only has the, itemize, has the standard deduction been greatly increased, but even if you do itemize, one of the changes in the tax law that has a significant effect on these people is that the maximum amount of state income taxes and, pro- and property taxes combined that you can deduct as an itemized deduction in these states taps out at $10,000. So if you live in a state such as, I said, New York, for example, and you're paying a 9% tax rate, say you make $300,000 of income, that would be a $27,000 tax. That $27,000 tax, say if you had a federal tax rate of 30%, that would be $8,100 of tax that you would not be paying because of that deduction on your federal return. Well, most of that will be gone because it's capped out at 10000 and then, like I said, the itemized deductions would only be um, beneficial to you if you have a higher amount than the standard deduction. So in addition to living in a state where everything um, is generally more expensive, property is more expensive, the weather is colder, um, the weather is, you know, there's cold weather. In addition to that, you're paying much higher taxes, especially now it's a new tax law. It would sound like to me, based on everything that you just said, for anybody who's on the fence, this would be enough to get them off of the fence if they're looking to relocate. Have you seen in your own practice an increase in interest uh, in recent months? Yes, I have, actually. Um, I generally see every year people wanting to move down, you know, obviously because of the weather and, you know, everything is generally more expensive um, and because of the taxes. But even more so now, I've been seeing an uptick in people interested in moving to Florida, especially because of the nor'easters that they keep having. So um, I would expect that trend to continue, especially with the new tax law. So, Jason, I have a question. What is the process for establishing residency in Florida? I mean, how does somebody go about that? That is a great question, Lisa. Thank you for asking that. Um, There is a number of steps that need to be taken to not only, um, you know, show that you are no longer a resident of a state such as New York, but more importantly is that um, a state like New York sees this happening all the time, people wanting to show they're no longer a resident of New York due to the high income tax rates. So the state is extremely aggressive in going after people who they feel are really residents of New York that are trying to claim that they're not. So generally, um, the, if, you had, if, um, a per, if a person was, a taxpayer was audited by the state of New York, they would look at five factors to determine if you're a resident or, resident or not of New York. And this is a great guideline to use to prove that you are no longer a resident because obviously if you could pass the audit, then you're in good shape. Um, the first one is your home. Um, basically, where do you have a home? Do you have a home in say, Do you have a home in Florida, and do you have a home in New York? If you have a home in both places, then that makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, so then, really, it depends on um, a number of factors. So some of those include um, they'll want to know which residence was owned first. Um, is one a rental? What is the value and size of each residence? What actions did you take to remove yourself from your old community? Have you established roots in your new community? Where do your children go to school? Where does your family spend holidays? So really, it's not very straightforward, but it's really based on facts and circumstances, and then everything is weighed together, and then they make a determination um, to decide if you are considered a resident or not. Um, after they look at your home, um, so some of the proof they'll want to see is they want they would want you to produce closing statements, moving bills, insurance policies, descriptions of the properties. If your children are in school, they'll need confirmation of your enrollment. So these are the type of things that you want to make sure that you have readily available. Perhaps put them in a, a file that you can keep with your accountant. So if the um, state of New York ever decides to look um, to see to question whether you really have left New York. In, in this example, then you would have that information. Some of the other factors we look at after that is where do you have an active business? The factors consider your pattern of employment and compensation you derive from that employment, and it'll also examine your business involvement other than employment. So you'll need to establish, they'll want to establish where you actually work on a day-to-day basis, as well as the location of your primary offices. If you're a shareholder in a New York business, they'll want to see how much you participate in the day-to-day management of that business. Then they also look at time. Where do you spend more time? Are you a snowbird who spends part of your time in New York and part of your time in Florida? If you spend more time in Florida than New York, then that'll be, that'll certainly help your cause. 
Um, so you'll definitely need to be able to document where you spend your time, um, 